everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. We get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Before I get to my guest, Richard Serrett, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get these great interviews as well. Please leave comments so I know what you're thinking and who you want me to interview. Before further ado, I bring to you Mr. Richard Serrett. How are you doing, Richard? Hey, Ernest. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate it. This is a dream come true. I've been a radio overnight um listener for years and years and years um before we get into that just for a few people that uh may not know just give us a little bit of your background but i'm pretty sure uh my what my viewers are going to know who you are well i am uh, a creature of talk radio right out of college i started at a, a 50,000 watt blowtorch station in toronto cfrb yeah. which has been on the air since 1927 i got to work with all of the the uh, the talk radio luminaries in Canada, everyone from Wally Crowder to Ed Needham, Larry Solway, you name it, uh, John Oakley. I later produced John, and um, we went over to um, talk radio, uh, talk six forty. I think it was called Talk Radio for Guys, Mojo. That's what it was, um, and we did a morning show. So I've always been in my entire working uh, professional life. I've been in talk radio. Started out as a producer in 2000. I got a, my own show on a Sunday night. And um, I gradually introduced little elements of conspiracy and paranormal mm -hmm. into the program until it just kind of took over and took over me, <laughs> really. Uh, and then, you know, I moved to different stations in Toronto. I've always worked in Toronto. I've been very fortunate. Always worked major market, up and down the dial, 1010, um, 640, then 740. And uh, did the same type of uh, of programming, conspiracies, paranormal, UFOs, the show, you know, it had different names at different radio stations. Yeah. Uh, and then in uh, 2009, I, I, um, I got a call from the vice president of talk radio at Premier Radio Networks asking me to fill in for George Norrie on a Friday. Wow. That was and, huge. Uh, that was like, yeah, that um, – you know, not that CFRB wasn't a big deal and all of that, but to me, it was like getting a call up from the Yankees, you know, after riding the buses for my entire career. It's not a, exactly a fair analogy, but I, know, I, know. Um, I mean, coast to coast. I mean, in terms of, you know, this type of arena, conspiracies, paranormal, coast is it, right? I mean, I, like many, many, many people, I, I listened to uh, Art Bell for many years and and um, he was a real pioneer in the field. So, uh as of 2014, uh, I've been a regular guest host on Coast to Coast AM, usually a Friday, Saturday, or a Sunday. And uh, then I um, uh, I left behind my my own late night. I had a, a weekly late night syndicated radio program. I finally uh, pulled the switch on that in uh, in August of last year. Mm -hmm. I just I simply couldn't do everything. <laughs> I I have two boys, so uh, I have a podcast that drops three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's called Strange Planet, and it's the same type of fare that you get on Coast to Coast. And um, uh, you can go to my my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and uh, you can stream it there, and you can subscribe. So that's my crazy career in a nutshell. Perfect. Hey, thank you. Um, something you said um, is quite unique as well. I believe Art Bell got his start on a Sunday with Dreamland. That I did not know. Yeah, I remember listening to Dreamland. It was usually Sundays. And then I, I think it morphed into, you know, his overnight with Premiere. But right. in any event, before I forget, I always do, I always forget. Um, what's the opposite of uh, unsubscribe, Richard? Well, subscribe, of course. Do as Richard Serra says and subscribe to the channel so you get these great interviews. You can great interviewees. Yes, I got to commend you too. I just uh, I finished watching your interview with D. Snyder oh. from uh, Twisted Sister, and I know uh, his his bandmate uh, John French a little bit. JJ French mm -hmm. uh, for many years followed my my late night uh, syndicated weekly program, and right. and um, he started corresponding me with me over email, and uh, he he's been on my show a couple times and on Coast, and I was on on his uh, new podcast. I think he's on podcast one. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, John's a great guy. JJ is a great guy. And uh, I really enjoyed your interview with D and I'm, I'm a huge uh, rock fan. What right am I, on. and you do, you do such a terrific job, Ernest, uh, interviewing some of the, uh, the luminaries and rock and roll heroes. So um, wow. if anyone is interested in that kind of fair, 
then um, Cross Border Rock Talk is the place to go. Border City Rock, but that's okay. I'm sorry, Border City Rock. Let me that's try that. All right, one. that's all right. Hey, you're a busy man. I mean, you've got a you're on the radio every other minute, so I mean, you you can't remember everything. Thank you so much. What I want to get to into ne- get into now, like I've been listening to some of your older um, um, interviews. You had one with Ezra Levant, which was great. You uh, recently uh, Charlie Robinson, uh, deliberate destruction of the Western civilization was good. The Bush family diaries or whatever. Um, but anyways, I remember one of those uh, guests you had on Richard was um, was you know obviously. Um, they were telling you how intelligent you are. And I think you're so intelligent. That's why I listen to you. I listen to you. So I want to talk and see what your opinion on uh, these balloon wars. What's going on here? <laughs> I wish I knew. I tell you one thing, though, whatever they are. Uh, um, and the first one supposedly was a, um, a uh, communist Chinese surveillance uh, balloon. And I have no doubt that they I think it's pretty much confirmed now they have a program part of the uh, uh, People's Liberation Army, they have this high altitude surveillance um, program with these balloons and a number of countries around the world have reported them. So they're probably up there all the time. Uh, For whatever reason, somebody in Montana with a cell phone happened to to spy one. So, you know, they may be up there all the time. What these latest incursions are, the one we saw over the, well, we saw three over the weekend. We saw One near Alaska that was intercepted by an F-35. We saw another one that came further into Canada that uh, our um, our prime minister claimed he ordered it shot down. He did no such thing. <laughs> Basically, he got a call from NORAD, said, uh, okay, we're going to take it out. Um, you know, just so you know, we're keeping you in the loop as a, as a NORAD partner. Yeah. And of course, he said, okay, go for it. Um, then over Lake Michigan. Yeah, there was one over Lake Michigan, then later Lake Huron. And of course, uh, the previous week, there was one that traversed the entire continental United States before they decided to blow it out of the sky over the uh, Atlantic near South Carolina. So um, whatever they are, and uh, whether these are, whether the late, the last three were also surveillance balloons, I don't know. But what they do is provide a wonderful distraction. I was talking about this today on my uh, my drive home show. You think about what happened this past weekend. Um, we learned um, more about that horrible train derailment in East Palestine, uh, Ohio, all of these toxic chemicals that they decided they were going to just basically set fire to them and burn them off so that they could open up that that rail corridor. Uh, meanwhile, they're creating all of this hydrochloric uh, acid um, fumes in the air. We have cattle dropping dead 100 miles away. I mean, this could be end up being like you know, the United States version of Chernobyl, uh, the worst environmental disasters in American history, maybe North American history. Uh, But nobody's talking about it. Uh, There are reports that some journalists that are trying to get close to the scene are being threatened with arrest. Uh, Meanwhile, the the, um, Environmental Protection Agency is telling the the residents, go home, you know, don't worry about it. Um, So, you know, we're being distracted from that. Yeah. We're also being distracted uh, from this latest Seymour Hirsch story about. Huge. The, yeah, it's it's huge. And nobody's talking about it except for maybe, you know, Tucker Carlson. He talked about it on Wednesday and then said nothing on Thursday. Uh, but um, Seymour Hirsch, you know, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning um, investigative journalist. He broke the Abu Ghraib story that um, yep. prison in, in, in Iraq. Um I think this is a credible report that the United States last June um, had uh, some uh, Navy divers on a uh, NATO exercise. They planted these bombs Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were detonated remotely. They had the technology. Then you had Joe Biden, of course, um, you know, like a a month before the the pipelines were blown up, basically saying that they would be destroyed. You had Victoria Nuland, the Nuland, the assistant uh, direct uh, assistant. Uh, Secretary of State or Deputy Secretary of State uh, saying the same thing. Well, she was also the ambassador to Ukraine for how many That's years? Right. That's right. She was. And she, um, uh, I'm not sure what role she had, but she, back in 2014, she kind of um, decided, you know, she was, she was caught on a, um, right. a piece or of audio. audio that was leaked saying, you know, never mind. Um, Europe will pick the, will pick the president of Ukraine. We'll decide who it's going to be. Yeah. So, okay. 
again, that's that's another whatever these things were. These they, they provided this amazing distraction. All of this excess uh, mortality. These reports coming out. Uh, around the world and all these countries that have the highest vaccination rates. Yeah. Uh, you know, is, hey, Richard, this is going on YouTube. So I don't know. We got to be careful with the C stuff. <laughs> As you know. True. Okay. True enough. Yeah. So yeah. I don't get Yeah. It's okay. I'm just, I just wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I hear you. Yeah. There's a distraction. And you know what? I kind of have, um, I kind of think that there's something fishy with, all of a sudden, there's these things being shot out of the air, but we don't see them. There's no evidence of what they are. So they very well could be a made-up distraction or not. Because I'm thinking this way. You might have balloons that have surveillance technology that are 10,000, 50,000 feet up in the air. But they're how stable can they be to, to surveil an object or a military site when they're being bounced around by the trade winds? Where you have satellites that are operating like clockwork. So I, I'm, I'm confused with that, to be honest with you. It is very, it does seem kind of archaic, the technology, as you say, when they have these satellites. I've been told, though, that these um, th these can get, I guess, details that the satellites can't, although, I mean, it depends on who you believe and who you read and who you follow. Yeah. Some people, these, these uh, satellites can now, you know, take... Uh, uh, incredible, you know, incredible resolution up to like, I don't know, five feet or something, you know, just yeah. unbelievable technology. So it's hard to say uh, whatever they are. As I think the main point though, is the distraction. We're like yeah. magpies. They have cultivated a, a culture of magpies. Uh, we're constantly scrolling on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. Um, we have this insatiable uh, need that they've, they've created, we've allowed them to create. So we're always just like uh, looking for the, whatever's, you know, trending and we're following it blindly. And then we move on to the next thing. So they're, they're leading us around by the nose. Yeah. And that's what happened on the weekend. And that's exactly. And that was, it was exactly the way it is going. You pointed it out two major things and it's a distraction, right? Mm. There's, there's so many examples of that. Well, one thing that is interesting, China has even said that they have tracked something over their territory. So I don't know how much that's true, but whatever. I'm sure everybody's doing it to everybody. Yeah, well, exactly. That's 100%. Um, that being said, um, where should we go next? So I got into talk radio. I understand you got into, uh, you got the calling from watching Johnny Carson. Or yeah. listening to Johnny. Yeah, listening is 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 right because um, my bedroom, my brother and I shared a bedroom. We were right across the hall from my parents, and um, of course, the Tonight Show came on at eleven thirty, so I was supposed to be fast asleep. So I didn't watch the Tonight Show. I listened to it through the um, through the bedroom door, and um, um, I don't know. I guess I kind of denied that that's what I wanted to do um, until I, I went through high school. I really didn't think about pursuing a career in radio. Um, and then I decided journalism sounded more credible or more practical. So I tried journalism for a while, um, but my heart wasn't into it. And then I finally, somewhat later in life, I guess I'm a late bloomer. I was um, in my mid twenties. I decided, no. Nope, I'm going to, I'm going to get into radio and television and uh, never look back really. But yeah, I, I go back to uh, listening to, uh, to Johnny Carson and Doc Severinsen and Tommy Newsom and all those great guests. I mean, back uh, in the nineties, it I mean, I don't know how, I don't know 90% of the people that are on these talk shows anymore, but, you know, these musicians and so forth. But back then it was like Bob Hope and Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. And all these amazing, like a who's who of entertainers, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm the same way. I, I kind of got into um, the philosophy or the mindset of, I enjoyed listening to other people talk about different um, subjects hmm. and not necessarily just like, you know, sitting at a coffee shop and talking about work. So, I found that interesting. And then when I found Art Bell, it was quite interesting how I found that out. Um, I was by, I was always interested in, well, first of all, I was I couldn't sleep. 
<laughs> in high school. I just couldn't sleep. My brain was always going. So I bought a shortwave radio because I was thinking I want to listen to somebody from around the world. So I started fooling around with that thing. Couldn't get that thing to tune in too well, but I did hear some different channels from around the world. But then for some reason, Art Bell came in on a Sunday night and his bumper music came in. Mm. And then the next Sunday I listened to it and I was hooked. And then I started listening to his uh, his guests. And so I'm going to ask you, because you're definitely in this genre of understanding, what do you think of Bob Lazar and the story? And um, have you found any cracks in his story? And um, do you believe him or no? Uh, you know, that's a tough one. And mo everything that I know about Bob Lazar, I learned from George Knapp, my yeah. colleague at uh, Coast to Coast AM, and uh, who I just think is a, a an amazing journalist and brings such credibility to the, to the whole UFO arena because he's just such this hard-boiled, you know, TV reporter. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that George Knapp tells the story and I've listened to his interviews with Bob Lazar. It sounds very credible. Um, you know, that he um that he was taken to the uh the S4 lab and and um uh this whole story that gets you know into uh, almost aspects of time travel and and uh the use of a particular um, element on the periodic table mm -hmm. uh, to slow down time, and there's a story about seeing this candle uh, in a lab, and it and it stopped flickering at a certain point because it was like frozen in time. And, and the detail is what's incredible. Of course, he talks about seeing um, and working on a craft and back engineering craft and so forth, and then um, how the company he worked with, and now I've forgotten the. Um, I'm not sure if it was JPL. Um, laboratory. Was it in New Mexico? Uh, I believe so. But his entire employment yeah, JPL. record. JPL. Yeah, his entire employment record was just expunged from the historical record like he never existed, except I think somebody, and maybe even he had, you know, hard copies and so forth. They tried to erase him, but he he had hard evidence that he did, that he was who he said he was and he worked where he said he, he did. Um, now there's a, I think one thing that's interesting is um, the theory that he was shown certain things uh, and fed certain information to be an unwitting sort of disinfo agent. He didn't realize that that he was being used in that way. Uh, because I've talked to um, people that worked at Area 51. They're, they're called the they have a, an organization called the Roadrunners. Oh, and, um, you know, they, um, well, they can't confirm or deny that they worked there, but that's, they did. Yeah. And, uh, th they are adamant that the, the whole UFO, um, is a cover story. The whole UFO thing is a cover story. That's basically was created to what, you know, to, to, to distract. Once again, there's that word to distract from what's really going on in area 51 and that all of this advanced technology they have is made right here on earth it's not back engineered but they created this backstory just to kind of again distract and confuse people so um the theory is that bob lazar was used as kind of a useful fool in that regard that they would they they he thought he was genuinely you know he saw certain things and he was telling the truth as far as he was concerned he didn't realize that he was being fed a lot of this information and it was it was a hoax so where am I in all that? That's always been a tough one for me because I am, um, I approach the whole um, UFO ET narrative from a biblical perspective because I'm, um, I'm an Orthodox Christian. And, and so everything has to, for me has to go through my, the, the faith filter and the biblical narrative and how does it fit in the biblical narrative? Um, and so I don't, I don't personally subscribe to uh, advanced civilizations on other planets uh, anywhere in the universe, I think we're unique. I think we're alone, but I do, I do believe in interdimensionals. And, uh, that to me is how ETs kind of square with the Bible is that, that they are from the angelic realm. Um, Nephilim. yeah, yeah. The Nephilim. Um, so moving on, what are your thoughts on Elon Musk? And I'm asking this because Elon is an interesting one for me. Um, 
he's very much involved with Neuralink, which is kind of with uh, the same kind of direction the WEF and Schwab wants to go with, um, you know, melding the body, the mind and the brain with technology and things like that. So Neuralink's that one thing that I'm thinking, okay, is this good for us? Unless it's, you know, somebody has a seizure and they can, you know, use that technology to have them not have seizures, but there's always a nefarious part of it. But then I look at him and what he's done with Twitter and he's restored and he's released all these, um, as we know now, um, suppressed purposely truths uh, in that realm. So do you have any thoughts on, on, on Elon? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, conflicted. I think the same way you are, yeah. but one thing, um, that I try to remind myself and that is, you know, um, we tend to, I think maybe it's part of human nature. We project ourselves onto other people. And when we don't, when they don't reflect back exactly what we want them to reflect back, it's like, you know, well, they're either a hundred percent or you're, you're against us. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's practical or fair. So hmm. Elon Musk, again, yes, I agree. I think he's a great champion of, of freedom of speech. In fact, I think his takeover of Twitter um, may be one of the most important things that's, that's happened in, in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and certainly it's going to go a long way. I mean, if we're going to ever, um, I, I guess I believe we're in this Titanic battle right now, you know, the globalists versus the nation state. And if the nation state and the populists are ever going to come out on top, um, we need Twitter. We need, you know, we need platforms like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I think he's incredibly transparent. Uh, he's a lot like Donald Trump that way. You know, he, he's up like the guy never sleeps, you know, he's mm -hmm. tweeting at three o'clock in the morning or someone, yeah. somebody with 500 followers complains that they're being, I don't know, shadow banned or something. And he'll respond to them and say, okay, I'm working on it. Wow. So I, 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 I like his character. I like what he's doing at Twitter, the Neuralink thing. Yeah. That's somewhat troubling. Um, I think I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on that. And, and I, I think he, um, he sees that, uh, um, as a way of perhaps helping the, the handicapped. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. But you never really know, but I, I, um, I just, I, I don't like, uh, throwing people overboard or under the bus simply because yeah. there are certain aspects of them that I disagree with. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you have to just kind of look at the totality and I, you know, electric vehicles, I think electric vehicles, I think it's a complete farce. Um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not practical. It's not going to, it's not going to happen. From what I understand, and I, I am on the same page as well. I'm actually reading, believe it or not, I just got this two days ago. Can you see that? Yes. Tesla. There you go. Okay. I'm just reading that. And I've always been a big fan of Tesla's. Um, I think uh, JW McGinnis was on to, uh, our Bell show and I, re I listened to that over and over. But with Tesla and the vehicles, a lot of people don't know, and I'm not a scientist. I'm not trying to be one, but from what I understand, from scientists, a lot of them would say, is to get the batteries, they have to use some certain types of mineral that they have to dig out of the mountains, uh, put through a smelter or whatever. So it's it's not as eco-friendly as you think. No, you have to drive, um, one study I, um, I, I read cited, you'd have to drive about 100,000 kilometers in an electric vehicle in order to get the advan the CO2 advantage versus mm -hmm. an internal combustion engine. Because as you say, all of the CO2, you've got these huge diesel trucks in the mines extracting all of this material. The amount of material you have to extract, you know, just to build one battery is just enormous. There's not, you cannot replace the, the, the fleet of every car that's in the United Kingdom right now. There's not enough cobalt and lithium around. It can't be done. And that's, you know, that's one battery. Um, then you have to replace the battery. It's just on so many levels, it's just unworkable. Um, up here in Canada, well, you know, Sault Ste. Marie, it gets pretty cold. Yeah. Uh, you know, take your your cell phone outside when it's minus twenty, and you and, and watch the, the 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 battery just like sink like a stone. Yeah. So the range is going to be reduced by like thirty percent. You're going to have people stranded. 
on a, on a, on a lonely stretch of highway in Saskatchewan and, ma- and minus 30. Now they want to build, like they want to, they want a, a, f- a fleet of ambulances and fire trucks and police cars, wow. electric vehicles. And then you have the ethical concerns, you know, the, the cobalt mines in the Congo, these are children. It's like child labor. Yeah. Uh, it's on so many levels. It's just a non-starter as far as I'm concerned. And the, uh, the drain on the grid, you're going to increase uh, demand on the electrical grid by 23%. Uh, that's just here in Canada. Um, how are you going to produce electricity? Like people think a battery is fuel. No, it's storage. Where's yeah. this? Where's the fuel coming from for the electric car? From from uh, gas fired plants, from nuclear energy, from coal uh, in the United States. It's yeah. there's nothing green about electric vehicles. Yeah, and you know definitely, and we're we're standing on the same page once again with that. And we can go and talk for hours on the different things about what's happening right now with the um, climate change agenda. But uh, we'll move on. So you've interviewed JJ French. Uh, a lot of my viewers are here hoping for a rock star uh, kind of a story. So other than JJ, um, I'm sure you've you've interviewed other musicians, correct? Or you've talked yeah. to Jim Morrison, but uh, Jim Morrison, yeah, I had I uh, I met his his former brother in law uh, down in San Diego when I was doing a, a TV show um, at a television show called The Conspiracy Show that ran for yeah, it's about five seasons and. We covered the uh, the whole, you know, did Jim Morrison fake his death or was he murdered or what happened, you know, in that bathtub in Paris. So yeah. uh, I met his brother-in-law. Um, it was fascinating. Uh, and um, really uh, painted a very different picture of Jim Morrison that I wasn't aware of. I mean, that he was basically the product of um, of um, alcohol, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. His, well, okay. Uh, yeah, and and was basically born an alcoholic, uh, and just you know started drinking at a very very young age, um, and um, I mean was was a, a, a mad poet. I mean he um, I think was destined to burn out pretty early, and of course he had such a fascination with a lot of these French. Um, uh, poets and one of them I was it um, I can't remember the name of the poet who who um, uh, contemplated faking his death. Uh, oh. Was that Rimbaud? I can't remember now. Rainier. Uh, That's the only thing I can think of. But I'm not sure who, which one it was. But um, yeah, that was a fascinating interview with uh, what was his name? Was it Graham? Alan Graham, I think, was his brother-in-law. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of you know classic rock and psychedelic rock and mm-hmm. um i had a, a podcast called the rock and roll twilight zone where i kind of married the two you know arenas rock and and the paranormal and um we did about 40 episodes and i'm still very proud of it it was kind of done in kind of a documentary style loved it um speaking of another musician um that's um definitely into the not even conspiracies anymore a lot of these are facts but Roger Waters is is a very high profile um, uh, former music. Well, he's a musician still, obviously yeah. Pink Floyd, and he was just a guest at the UN. Did you see that where he spoke about peace talks for Ukraine? I, I didn't. Yeah, something? I didn't hear. I didn't hear his speech, but I saw where he had recently uh, uh, t- talked there. And uh, yeah, he's um, uh, very political. Obviously, I mean, I don't always agree with some of his. I think he's a little more left leaning okay. uh, than I am, but I think he has it right when it comes to Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's yeah, it's high time that that uh, Ukraine sue for peace. And I think it's up to the West to start to pressure Ukraine into. Unfortunately, they're going to have to be realistic and make some territorial concessions. Right, the reality right. on the ground is you know the eastern region of Ukraine, primarily Russian speaking, and you're dealing with a. Uh, a nuclear giant here not to be trifled with so um mm-hmm. yeah they've they got to sit down and get it done yeah he's all he's also been a great proponent of uh julian assange mm. yes and um yeah so um who would you say would be like i don't know have you uh had somebody do a kind of a calculation on the interviewees you've had over the years i remember jj french in your interview with him uh twisted business uh he said they did nine thousand shows like i i can't even fathom that how many how many interviewees have you done wow roughly 
Okay, so let me see. Um, let's see, one show a week for oh, over 20 years. So that's, let's say, 50 times 20. What is that, 10,000? Yeah. Uh, so plus, you've got some repeats in there as well. Bring back some some favorites. So I don't know. Let's. I'm, I'll be very conservative. I'll say maybe five thousand different guests. That's just on the the late night radio show. Yeah, uh, but you've all, like you've you've had Saga AM where you've interviewed people. Yeah. Um. Your your show Strange Planet, and then your guest appearances on Coast AM where you're a regular. Yeah. Guest host. So. Yeah. Wow. Who would you say? if you could say a couple were the ones that, you know what, if I didn't get any of these other ones, these were the ones that I liked best for this reason or that sort of. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, it's not necessarily the high profile people. And I've, and I've been fortunate to interview some high profile people on my saga show. I interviewed Dr. Ben Carson, who, ran for president. I've had Naomi Wolf on a couple of times and, you know, some high profile politicians. And, um, you know, I met, I got, uh, I interviewed Alan Parsons and from the Alan Parsons project, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of high profile people, but to me, I just love really great storytellers, people who can, who can tell the story well, uh, and who are passionate about it. And uh, I mean, as a, as a host, you know, that there's kind of a, a, a laundry list of things that make for a really great guest. Uh, it's not necessarily their celebrity. I mean, if they happen to be high profile and, and also tick the other boxes, so be it. But uh, I'll give you an example. Um, recently, I interviewed this um, fellow on uh, Coast and on my podcast, William Sheehan, and he lives in Long Island and he's, uh, he collects Bigfoot encounter stories and he has a podcast and um, he, he approaches Bigfoot in a completely different way. We, you know, we hear so often that Bigfoot is this gentle giant and he's an herbivore and he communicates telepathically and he just wants to be left alone. And he's this wonderful, benign creature. Uh, William Sheehan though, tells a very different, paints a different, a very different picture based on the thousands and thousands of eyewitness accounts that he's collected. And that, that is of a, a very violent predatory <laughs> creature. Um, and he, he tells, I mean, he, just the way that he presents is just incredible. And of course he's got this wonderful Long Island uh, accent and, um, he's so passionate about it. And he tells, he just paints, paints such wonderful sort of mental images. So to me, he's just like a fantastic guest. Um, another one is, uh, Max Hawthorne, who's, uh, known as the Prince of Paleo Fiction and, uh, imagine, um, the guy that wrote Jaws, uh, Peter Benchley, is it Peter Benchley? Um, I'm or Robert? Sure. Yeah, I think it's Peter Benchley. It's Peter, I think. It's and then, um, combine Benchley with Michael Crichton of Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he, he creates, you know, these, um, these, uh, prehistoric marine creatures that somehow, you know, survived the, uh, the great extinction event and, um, come back to life and, you know, terrorizing, uh, coastal towns all over North America. Um, but he also is an, he's, um, an amateur archeologist and he's an avid fisherman and he's like a, an Ernest Hemingway type of character. Mm -hmm. uh, he loves to box. Uh, he's a great writer, but then he also, he, he talks about what he calls real life, you know, sea monsters like giant, uh, giant sea turtles and, and, um, uh, you know, huge, huge sharks that are capable of devouring great whites that he suspects that may actually still exist deep, wow. deep, deep, deep in the ocean. So, um, he's a, he's a great guest too. I mean, um, makes me, uh, you know, I, I love to go and uh, float on my back in in the, uh, the Messinian Bay in Greece. It's one of my favorite things to do, but you know, after I talk to Max, it's like, I'm afraid to dip a toe <laughs> in the, in the, in the water again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, when you've done Coast, uh, you've been doing that for about a decade now, as a guest? Um, I have been a regular since January 2014. I did a one-off in 2009, which was kind of a tryout. And then I never heard from them again in five years. And I thought, okay, well, I guess I didn't hit it out of the park. Wow. So, but that's it. I did one. And I thought, well, the, you know, I can say I did one coast to coast. And then five years later, I got a call 
from uh, Lisa Lyon, and I became a regular since January 2014. So nine years. Well, so how did that one-off happen? You sent in, and were they looking for somebody, you know, and so you sent in like a demo, or they just reached out to you for some reason? Uh, my lovely bride, the mighty Aphrodite, who is my fiercest critic and my biggest fan, it was her idea. Um, she just thought, okay. She, somehow she found out that the vice president of, of talk at Premier at the time, and I've forgotten the gentleman's name, um, Oliver. Anyway, he was from Montreal originally. Oh, She found this out and she said, you know what? You should um, uh, throw your hat in the ring for coast to coast. I said, are you crazy? Come on. She goes, no, the, uh, the VP uh, at Premier is from Montreal. Maybe he'll think it's a great idea to have a fellow Canuck. Yes. So she, it was her idea. She put together this package. I, I, I forget what she put in there, my resume. And I think I had a demo, a demo tape burned onto a CD. She put that in there. And um, I remember uh, because we're Greek Orthodox and she had the, um, the um, you know, the incense um, burning and she kind of uh, waved the envelope over the incense and she <laughs> plastered some Canadian flags on the envelope and she sent that off. And then, yeah, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, one day the phone rings and it's him. And he said, what are you doing Friday? And I said, um, no plans. I said, how'd you like to sit in for George Norrie? He's, he's going out to dinner to celebrate his daughter's birthday. So that's how it started. Wow. I mean, and that's a great, I, I, I'm getting, I get segues a lot in my interviews, which are great because I've got things I'm going to ask. You brought it up. <clears throat> the mighty Aphrodite. Now I mm. Googled that, okay? I Googled Aphrodite. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to ask him about that. And then The Mighty Aphrodite was a movie. Yeah, Woody Allen movie. Based on. So <clears throat> can you tell me and the viewers why you call your wife The Mighty Aphrodite? Uh, just be, for one thing, I just wanted to give her a sort of a nom de, uh, a nom de plume. What would you hmm. say for broadcasting? A nom de air, perhaps? Yeah. Just to protect her because she has her own, you know, a professional life out, you know, and... um I didn't want her to, uh, I'm sure people could put, you know, two and two together, but, um, so that was the, the first thing. And then I don't know the, the obvious, because she's Greek, I thought of Aphrodite right. because, you know, she's like the paragon of beauty. Oh, okay. And, there you go. Yeah. And then also I was, um, I know it's not politically correct anymore, but it, you know, at the time I was, a, I was, I was a huge Woody Allen fan. I'm still, am. I think he's just a, a great writer and he was a terrific filmmaker. I used to go to see every movie that he made. Yeah. Come out. And so I remember that movie. So, and she's mighty to me. So she became the mighty Aphrodite. And you've got two mighty twin boys in Thornhill. Do? Yes. 16 years old. Wow. Um, do they have aspirations or you're like, okay, you guys just live, do what you want. Sort of. They thing. Yeah. They, they, um, well, they're, they're in grade 11 now. So they're, they're putting together their, uh, their courses for next year. So, you know, they're, they just, they're meeting with guidance counselors. My one son, Actually, he's expressed an interest in following in his old man's footsteps. He's yeah. he loves he loves broadcasting and he loves um, journalism. But he's also a huge. Both of them are huge sports fans. I mean, you yeah. name it. Um, they're into tennis and golf and basketball and baseball and they love to fish and they love hockey. They're into everything. And so I think um, he's angling towards um, maybe. Um, uh, sports journalism or sports broadcasting, something like that. And um, my other son, uh, he's still trying to figure it out. He he thought about um, a teaching. He loves history, but also, um, you know, he loves business and communications. So that would be, um, you know, maybe more in his, in his mother's footsteps. She's, uh, she's been in corporate communications um, in the past. So. Right on. Um, I won't keep you much longer, Richard. I appreciate your time. I just got a couple quick things I'd like to ask you, and it's kind of Coast Art, Art Bell related. Um, over the years when you've done your guest um, appearances, which are, I think it's, you got a couple a month, two or three weeks, or two weekends a month, something like that. You've got Connie Willis and George Knapp, and I think Ian Punnett as well. But have you interviewed Richard Hoagland or um, um, Graham Hancock? Uh, yes to both. I, I interviewed Richard Hoagland um, 
early on when I started back at Coast in 2014, might have been 2014, 2015. And I think I also interviewed him on my late night Sunday night show years and years before that. Wow. And then Graham Hancock, uh, yeah, I had him I had him on my late night show. I haven't interviewed him on Coast. It was after Fingerprints of the Gods, which came out in 95, I think. So I can't. Yeah, uh, yeah it's been a while. But I've, yes, I've interviewed them both. Wow. Those are kind of my kind of go-to guests. If I go and listen to an old Art Bell, uh, mm. um, it actually helps me sleep, to be honest with you, even I'll listen to yours. And it's not because you put me to sleep. It's just a relaxing and I think obviously you're um, you've got so successful in the overnight radio realm is like you have that voice, right? You either have it or you don't. Well, and some people, yeah, people find it um, soothing, I guess. Yeah, uh, and I, and me, I like it sounds sound, sometimes I sound like uh, Tom Waits uh, swallowed too much sandpaper or something. <laughs> and I like your intro. Um, everybody has their intro. I think um, but George has got one that's unique. He uses a word I'd never heard before. And I'm quite a wordsmith, but I like yours, you know, hang your cloak on a peg and, um, you know, that greasy spoon. I think that's just brilliant. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I love uh, theater of the mind and I yeah. constantly trying to think of ways to draw, you know, mental images for people and uh, paint pictures on the radio. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, introduction kind of it came together kind of slowly um you know the the, the bit about um well can you can you give it to us right now for the viewers? sure sure welcome to the audio imaginarium come on in weary traveler hang your cloak on a peg grab a stool and come gather around the fire there are stories to be told and you are among friends and then i have a, a second hour intro uh, that I used to do, which is, um, thanks for inviting me into your home, your long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well-appointed basement with a simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Yeah, I love it, man. It's just so relaxing. It's just brilliant. Um, so tell everybody, um, I think you're coming up on the 23rd, 24th weekend, 25th, 26th. You're on coast. Um, what are your um, topics on that? Do you have those um, nailed? I, yeah, you do, I believe. Uh, Feb 24th, which is a Friday. Well, it'll be Friday in L LA, which is where the show emanates from. But here it'll be the early morning of Saturday, Feb 25th. Uh, and incidentally, people can go to the website, strangeplanet.ca and my coast dates are there. Uh, what am I doing on the 24th? I should know. Uh, I think I have Micah, ha uh, Micah Hanks on. You know, Mike, Mike is a terrific um, writer. He writes about science and technology and space and, and UFOs. And he's published, I don't know, 20 books. Um, he's down there in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, Micah Hanks, I think, is going to be uh, with me in the first half. And then the second half is Open Lines, which I always enjoy. Right, right. And speaking of music, before I let you go, uh, Tom DeLong, have you spoken with him? No, I've not. I've not. Uh, Blink, uh, 180, Blink 182 and then uh, the Academy to the Stars, which we haven't heard from in a while. They kind of, they've been kind of quiet. Yeah, I'll have to check in on that. Uh, but he's big into uh, ufology and oh, uh, yeah. with Stephen Greer and all, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. Hey, I'd like to thank you so much, Richard, for taking your time out for um, for me. And um, I'm sure everybody's going to love this interview. Like I said, everybody just hit the subscribe button to get these great interviews. And once again, Richard, I appreciate it very much. Ernest, thank you so much for having me on. Great pleasure. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye.